We are continuing our series, and it's called Code Blue. Code Blue is a medical emergency. That means a patient is in critical condition. And we live in a world today that is constantly living in a code blue situation. The spiritual status of this nation is constantly in a state of crisis. Resuscitation is necessary. Revival is necessary. When a code blue team responds, they look at five different areas, and that's what we're looking at. Last week we looked at the rhythm of revival. We saw there's a pattern to revival in our own lives. The pattern is, is we release, we take all of our fears, all of our anxieties, all of our worries, all of our anger, all of our frustration with God or events or whatever it is that we have bottled up that's keeping us away from God, and we release that. And then we receive God's Word. We receive it as we're reading the Bible and a passage speaks to our heart. We receive it as the Holy Spirit puts it on somebody else's heart to speak into our lives. Or we receive it when we receive a message from, from God directly uh, speaking into our hearts. But we receive that Word. That's not enough, though. If you just do those two steps, you're not there. If I tell my kids... I need you to go in and clean your room, and they say, I receive that, I understand it, and then they don't go do it, I'm not going to be very happy with them, am I? I get that you told me to clean my room, then why didn't you do it? We, we've got to respond. We've got to do what God says. We obey, and then the last step is we repeat, and that's the rhythm of revival. Release, receive, respond, repeat. We do it all over again. Release, receive, respond, repeat. That's the rhythm of revival. So today we're going to talk about the rate of revival. Just as a normal, healthy heart has this pattern that it beats in, and that's called the rhythm, there's also a rate that is good that a heart has to have. The rate is essentially the number of beats per minute. So how many times your heart beats in a minute? For, for a normal, healthy person, the average rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Now, if you're a professional athlete, if you're in great cardiovascular shape, it can be as low as 40 beats per minute because you're in such great shape. The harder you work, the harder you exercise, I can feel it sometimes pounding like when, I'm, when I take the steps at the courthouse in Carthage because that elevator was built in 1898 and, and if you haven't noticed, I'm a little bit of a heavy set guy and I just don't trust that thing. So, and I can beat the thing up and I can beat it down anyway. And, and so I'll take those steps all three floors because the court's on the third floor. I can feel my heart beating. And it's beating a little faster than 100 beats a minute. I am positive of that. When you work, your heart beats faster. When you're at rest, your heart beats slower. If your heart's beating too fast for too long, that's not a good thing. And if your heart's beating too slow for too long, that's not a good thing either. There's a range you shoot for, and that's your heart rate. There's a rate you shoot for with revival too. And today we're going back to Acts 2. I was going to preach this message last week, and I felt led to start off with that one, but I would have felt incomplete if I covered all of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2 except verses 42 to 47. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're finishing up Acts 2. We're just looking at five verses today, but these five verses summarize one of the biggest revivals that ever happened, especially to the nation of Israel, but perhaps in the world. These five verses are a blueprint for what a church should look like when it's hitting on all cylinders properly. Verse 
42, which I read just a few minutes ago, tells us that the disciples devoted themselves to four things. Teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Those four things are the heart of revival. You may not know this, but your heart is made up of four different chambers. I can't name those for you. Ask my wife if you want to know what they are. But the heart I know is made up of four chambers. And just as the heart is made up of four chambers, revival is made up of four chambers as well. And it's those four that are listed in Acts 2.42. The first one is teaching. If you have the King James Version or you have the New King James Version of the Bible, I actually like what it says just a little bit better than the English Standard Version, which I'm reading out of today. That translates the word teaching as doctrine. In order to have revival, you have to have solid doctrine being preached. You have to have the message of Christ. The early church had this deep desire, this hunger for God's word. When you're hungry, what do you do? You eat. You find nourishment. You eat. They soaked up the teaching of the apostles. You say, didn't they read the word? Well, they couldn't read the word because the Bible wasn't printed just yet. But I guarantee you that if they would have had the word, they would have read the word because they were hungry for the word of God and they were getting it however they could get it. And in that case, it was sitting under the apostles, hearing the word preached. We live in a world where the word of God is more accessible than it has been at any other time in human history. You can for free download, if you have one of these, the Bible. You don't have to pay a dime. You can read it in about 50 different translations. Some of those you do have to pay for, but you have access to God's Word for free if you have one of these. And let's be honest, who doesn't? Maybe a few people, a handful of people. It is more available than it's ever been in anybody's lifetime. But listen to this statistic. This is the 2022 State of the Bible Report. I mentioned this Wednesday night about how many people read their Bible. Remember, I just I, I said, I, I think it would be this, but I think maybe that's even a little... Here's the statistic. If you were here Wednesday night, here it is. 10% of Americans, this is not, this is all Americans, read their Bible once a day. 10% of all Americans. 50% of Americans say we read our Bible three or four times a year. This early church had a hunger and a thirst for God. And they wanted that thirst quenched. They got it any way that they could. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, it says. They devoted themselves to the Word of God. That's where they got the Word of God, was through the apostles' teaching. And that was one of the chambers for revival that happened. Sometimes when we think of revival, we tend to think of these experiences. And, and this happened to me. Too often, we push aside our doctrine for our experiences that we have. When the sound of the mighty rushing wind whooshed in and fire fell on top of each person's head, they didn't rely on those experiences, but instead they checked those experiences with the Word of God. And Peter stood up and said, We're not drunk as you might think, but this is what the prophet Joel predicted. This is biblical, is what he's saying. This is what was predicted by Joel. It's right here. The experience lined up with the doctrine. And the experiences experienced at a revival have to be guided by doctrine 
It can't be doctrine being guided by experiences. Too many churches and too many revivals failed because it was based on the experience that didn't line up with the doctrine. Every healthy revival has one thing in common. There's a solid preaching of the Word of God, and it's an increase in that preaching and not a decrease. Lasting revivals are nourished, they're fed by biblical preaching and biblical teaching. They are fueled by a hunger and a thirst for God's people of more of His Word and more of His power in their life. We have momentary revivals that are like a, a brush fire that, that burns out and it's done. It's not like you know, a, a, a big fire that you see in California that burns for days or weeks or months and, and devastates everything in its path. And the problem with those typically is they lack a dependence on the word. You say, why are you putting such an, an, an importance on this one point? Because what does the word say? Faith comes how? By, by coming and having an experience? No, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. That's Romans 10, 17. Sometimes we start thinking that other things are just as important as the word of God. Sometimes we shift our emphasis over to our physical needs and we say, God, this is what I need. Lord, I just need to put food on the table. This economy is awful. And, and Lord, I don't need any of your word right now because I, when I sit down and, and start to read, I can't do it anyway because I'm so focused on, on how do I put food on my table in this economy. And we think that putting food on our table is the most important thing going on in our life. But what happened when Satan came and tempted Jesus? He, Forty days he'd gone without food. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm pretty sure your family's not gone without food for 40 days. And if they have, you need to let us know, and, and you need to be at helping hands, uh, because we'll help you if you're in that situation. Satan comes to Jesus. He said, hey, you look a little hungry. I'm paraphrasing here. You look a little thin there. You've lost some weight, Jesus. How about you turn those stones to bread if you're God? What did he say? Man shall not live by bread of loam, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen. There's things that are way more important than our physical needs. <clears throat> I don't think I can go a sermon without saying this, voice, this verse because it's so major. In fact, if you were here for prayer Monday night, when I was on vacation, I bought a shirt that has this verse on it and I wore it Monday night. It looks like a ball jersey and there's a big number 6 or 33. I can't remember which it is. But, but the verse is on it. Matthew 6, 33. Can you quote it yet? Not this way, because I always say it in King James. But today, I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. See, you can't quote it with me now. It says this, Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. You. Not everything you want. That's why you didn't win that Mega Millions Friday night. Everything you need. We have to be careful not to neglect the Word of God because we're so focused on our needs or we're focused on our priorities or we're focused on our entertainment. We have to prioritize the Word of God. There's a reason it's placed first in Acts 2.42. The Holy Spirit inspired it that way. There is no greater priority than the Word of God. Second chamber is fellowship. Not only were they devoted to their relationship with God, they were devoted to their relationship with each other. They were committed to building an open 
and an honest and, and a spiritually encouraging relationship with other of God's people, so they spent time together, not alone, together. They depended on one another. They were unified in love. They were unified in purpose. They were a church focused on relationships. It's time we learned in this life that you cannot walk through life on your own. It's great to raise your kids as self-dependent. We do that. We, we've, Drew can walk in and fix lunch for himself, for Joshua, for, for Ella. It's great that he is dependent, but he cannot make it through life on his own, and neither can you. You have to surround yourselves with other people. We need others around us. We need people with the same beliefs around us encouraging us when we go through the valleys and helping us to remember the mountaintop experiences when we go through those. So many times we have worldly friends and we spend all this time with them and they're the people we call whenever we hit a low in the valley. And what do they say? Because they're world. Well, why don't we go out and have a beer and drink your problems away? That's the answer that they know. That's not the correct answer answer. You have to learn to fellowship with other believers so that when you're in those moments, you can call somebody and they don't say, let's go drink our problems away. Let's drop to our knees and pray our problems away. Let me pray with you. Let's get down. Let's spend some time right here. Meet me at the church. Meet me at my house. Let's go out into nature, get close to God, but let's pray these problems away. We need to have fellow believers we can rely on to walk the path that we're walking on. We need friends who will do more than, than, than to just give us worldly solutions or give us advice. We need people that will pray with us, who will love us, who will help us through those. You need an accountability partner as well. Someone who can help you and hear you when you fail and somebody who can help lift you back up and, and pull you up when you fall. We need to have fellow believers who have walked that same path that we're walking and have been through it and can tell us, here's what happened with me and here's how God brought me through. That's encouraging. James tells us this. He says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. He says, that we may be healed. Now that's counterintuitive to the way we're raised, isn't it? Because as we're brought up in church, if I sin, I don't want anybody else to know that I'm not perfect. I don't want anyone else to know how, how unspiritual that I am. What's James say? James says, confess your sins to one another. That means you ought to be telling somebody about that sin. You ought to be praying for one another that we may be healed. You want healing, he says? Do these things. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. That's what brings healing. We need fellowship outside the four walls of this church. Fellowship among believers is not just going down and having a meal on Memorial Day or Labor Day or Christmas or Thanksgiving, whenever we have meals together. It doesn't also mean that we exile ourselves among believers exclusively. That's not what they did here. It says the church was adding to its number day by day. That means that unbelievers were seeing them as well, they didn't just exile themselves among believers. Is not what they did here in Acts 2, and it's not what Jesus did either, if you think about it. Jesus hung out with sinners, and he hung out with tax collectors. If you remember, the, 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 the tax collector Zacchaeus, the, the wee little man, I don't know if that's politically correct anymore or not, but... But he climbed up in a tree and Jesus walked by and he said, Hey, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house to eat lunch today. And those people are like, he's, he's, a, tax, he's a tax collector. Can, can you imagine the disciples? Does he not know this? And Jesus said, Hey, I'm coming to your, 
to your house today, and I'm going to eat some lunch, so get it ready. But listen to this, because this is important. We focus on that part. We focus on the fact that Jesus hung out with sinners, and we say, so it's okay for me to hang out with sinners all the time. But think about the roughest spots in Jesus' life, the, the, the mountain moments. I would say one of those was on the Mount of Transfiguration, wouldn't you? Whenever he went up and he was transfigured and he was white as, as if you'd just bleached your favorite colored shirt. He, he was glowing. How many sinners, how many non-followers of Christ were there that day? Zero. He had three of his closest followers. When he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, when, when he's sweating blood because he's so overcome by what's about to happen, how many unbelievers did he have at that point with him? Zero. He had his disciples and he had his closest disciples go a little bit farther in with him in that instance as well. There's a time for unbelievers... But there's a time at your mountain moments and at your valley moments when you ought to be surrounded by fellow believers. And to do that, you have to have fellowship outside the four walls of the church. We don't exile ourselves exclusively away, but we know that our people are there when we need them. And that's who we need to be turning to third thing is the breaking of bread. We don't really know exactly what they're referring to here when they say the breaking of bread. It could refer to, to three or four different things. Could mean they just ate together. They broke bread together. You remember that happened to those disciples on the road to Emmaus. They, they broke bread, meaning they ate together. Jesus broke the bread, and, and they're like, oh, that's Jesus. Their eyes were open when he broke the bread. Could be they mean the Lord's Supper or communion, as we call it. And that's what I want to focus on today. What, what is communion? When you break it down to its simplest element, communion is an act of worship, isn't it? It's an act of worship. You're, you're praising God. You're praising Jesus that, that He came to this earth, that He died, that He was buried, and that He was raised. You're, you're praising Him for his body that was broken, you're praising him for his blood that was shed that saved us from sin. Communion at its simplest is an act of worship. It's an act of thanksgiving. Worship is the third chamber of the heart of revival. When, when we take communion, I always read the same passage. I bet you get tired of hearing it. But that passage, Paul was writing to the Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is criticizing the Corinthians because they've allowed the Lord's Supper to devolve into this thing that, that it, it had become nothing more than just a meal. They weren't taking it seriously. They didn't have any consideration for the other people around them. They, they were just eating it however they wanted to. What does that break? They had lost the sense of worship in communion. And he says that's wrong. And he corrects them in that moment. Their devotion to worship, in this case it was represented by communion, it was supposed to be passionate, it was supposed to be real, but instead they had turned it into just another meal. Just another time when we come together and we eat and, and, and then we're done. And, and yeah, it's called the Lord's Supper, but really it's, it's my supper because, man, that was good and heh, too bad I already went through the line. You shouldn't have waited till the end. Sorry, there's not enough for you what he's talking about here. Too often today, worship becomes just something we do at the beginning of service. Okay, I worshiped five songs, then we hear the preaching, then we get to go home, and we get to stop and eat on the way. Praise God. 
Worship's just turned into something routine. I don't like this song. I am not singing this song again. I'm just going to stand here and I'm just going to stare bullets through John because he picks the songs and if I stare long and hard enough at him, he's going to get uncomfortable even though he's not paying a bit of attention to me and he's not going to put this song on the list anymore. But I'm not singing to this song anymore. I'm not raising my hands. I don't want anyone to think I'm too spiritual. <laughs> not lifting my hands during this worship. Hmm, this isn't a bad song, but I wonder how long the pastor going to preach today because Sirloin Stockade gets busy pretty quick. We need to really be there by about 12.10, and I know he's not going to stop that early, so mind starts to wander. In about a month, it's going to wander even more. Isn't it? Men. Women who are football fans. <laughs> Chiefs are getting ready to kick off. Why do they always have to have the noon game? Don't they know Pastor Jeremy can't shut up by noon and kick off? Did I hit the DVR button? Honey, can you set that DVR from your phone? Been there, done that. I can't set it on my phone. I have to ask Heather. We're focused a lot of the times during worship not on what's supposed to be the object of our worship, God. We're focused on ourselves and we're focused on our preferences and we're focused on our problems and we're focused on whatever else crosses our mind, anything but worshiping the God who is right in front of us wanting to meet with us today Worship is not just an act. Worship is not just a series of songs. You've heard me say this before. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is joy that pours out of you because you're in right relationship with God, not just for five songs on Sunday morning, but on Monday morning and Tuesday morning and Thursday and Friday and Saturday as well. Amen. Worship is something that should bubble up out of you at all times, not just during the song portion of the service. Listen, unsaved people will not think you're weird if you're lifting your hands in church. And if they think you're weird and they don't come back, that's okay. Did, I, did he just say that's okay? Yeah, I said that's okay. Because they weren't going to stay anyway if they think that's weird. And that's just not a Pentecostal thing. You know, Baptists lift their hands in wars. I've seen Catholics lift their hands. They're not going to find a church anyway if they're that picky. You focus on you. Now listen, if you start running around the building, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say, okay, that's not, we're not, we're not doing, this isn't a, a, a track. Unless you're praying on Monday night and you want to walk laps, that's fine. Focus on you. Don't focus on the chiefs. Don't focus on sirloin stockade. Don't focus on your preferences. Focus on you worshiping God. Focus on God. And that takes the you out of it. The world is, is hungry to know that there really is a God that people care enough that they're going to worship and put aside their problems. That's the kind of God the world wants. Not the kind of God that we go, oh, this one again. Oh, not this one. Fourth thing is prayer. Prayer was a high priority of the early church. You can't get around that. Every time as you read through the book of Acts and you see this amazing work of the Holy Spirit, it's accompanied by prayer. And any time that you see prayer, it's usually accompanied by this awesome act of the Holy Spirit. Now, it may be a one-line prayer, maybe a multi-line prayer. But you see all of these things that happen. When you see the activity of the Holy Spirit, you've seen prayer taking place. 
I love this commentary from the Fire Bible. I'm just going to read it in its entirety. It says this, They, being the early church, recognized prayer as the source of intimacy with God, which gave them sensitivity to His direction and allowed His power to work through them. If this wasn't on my head, I'd just drop it. Because that's all we need right there. I'll read it again. They recognize prayer as the source of intimacy with God, which gave them sensitivity to His direction and allowed His power to work through them. That's prayer. You've heard me say it's where the will of man meets the will of God. And you want the will of God to win. Because as it said, you're sensitive to what God has to say. Those are the four chambers of the heart. Revival, or teaching, fellowship, worship, and praying. That's your heart. That's the heart of revival, those four things. But here's the thing. Without a rate... The heart's pretty pointless. I remember a biology teacher, I think it was seventh grade, had a cow's heart sitting on his desk. The grossest thing in the world. Thankful I had him seventh hour and not fourth hour right after lunch. But I sat like two foot from that. You know how hard it is to look at somebody when they're lecturing, when there's a heart staring you in the face, two foot from your face? You know what good that heart did? None, other than to distract me. And I don't think that was a good thing, because I didn't make a very good grade in biology that year. What purpose did that heart serve? Not, it wasn't beating. It did not do a cow any good. That cow that it came from, I assume was in the ground somewhere or had a transplant if they do heart transplants on cows. I highly doubt that, but I don't know. I've got grandparents that did hip replacement on dogs, so maybe somebody loves their cow that much that they get a heart replacement. Without a rate, the heart is worthless. You can have... Those four things, teaching, fellowship, worship, and praying. But if it's not done with a rate, then it's pointless. It, it, the heart is not serving its purpose after the patient dies. There are hearts buried six foot underground at every cemetery you go through. They serve no purpose other than to rot and to decay because when they stopped beating, they brought death to the people whose body they were reciting, residing in. So what's the rate? We know what the heart is. What's the rate? The answer is in verse 46, the very beginning. Very end, sorry. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes... They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Just as your heart has to beat day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, so you can stay alive, there's a rate of revival, and that is day by day. It's mentioned twice in there. Day by day. Day by day, it says, they attended church together. Day by day, they fellowshiped together in their homes. Not just Thanksgiving, not just Christmas, not just Easter, whatever other holidays that, that, that they, they praised God for the food they were eating. No, it says it was every single day. Every single day, they were thankful for what God had given them. Day by day, they praised God. We wonder why we don't have revival in our churches 
today. We wonder why God doesn't seem like he, he doesn't, why it seems like God doesn't move like he did in the past in our country. And, and we blame things like the pastor, well, if he'd just preached this message, and if he'd just preached this message, then revival would come. Or we blame things like the music, and we say, well, if they would sing this song, and they would sing this song, I know that would bring revival, because I remember my great-grandma Vera waving her hanky to that, and that lady had revival, and I know that that would happen. I, I know that, that, that if these big churches would just take out those lights, that, that, that are over the stage and where it's all black in there, the movie theater, if they just put in a normal setting, that's what it would take to bring revival to them. Isn't it easy to blame everybody else but us? Here's what I learned in children's church. This stuck with me all those years later. When you point at somebody else, You've got one, two, three fingers pointing right back at you. Brother Jerry, I hope I did a good job with that. If we live in a time where we had a heart monitor hooked up to the average church today, the rhythm would call for a code blue. The rate would call for a code blue. Because we might see a big beat on Sunday morning and then we flatline till Wednesday and we see a little beat on Wednesday and we flatline till Sunday when we got a big beat again. How many of you know if your heart's beating three times a week, you're in trouble? It's true. They're going to bury you. The next time your heart beats, you're going to be in a casket underground. We are walking around in our lives dead half the time. And then we show up on Sunday morning and we expect God to give us this big beat that sustains us all through the week. And that is not the rate of revival. The rate of revival is day by day. You're in the Word every day. You're praying every single day. You're having fellowship of some type. You don't have to go to dinner with each other every single night, but you're having fellowship of some type. You're talking about something meaningful, something spiritual with some fellow believer every day. You are doing these things every single day. The fact of the matter is God shouldn't have to revive us every single week or once a year or once every five years because we ought to be living in revival every single day. The rate of revival is every single day. Every day our hearts ought to beat with teaching. Listen, we ought to be getting the Word on Sundays and on Wednesdays, but we ought to be in the Word on our own, reading, studying, praying. We ought to be soaking in these life-giving nourishments through this Word that the Holy Spirit has given us. We're like my kids a lot of times. What are we having for dinner? Roast. I'm not eating that. What's the matter with you? It's roast. I remember doing this as a kid. What are we having for dinner? Steak. Again? Now, the last time we had it, we weren't very wealthy growing up. Maybe twice a year, probably on special occasions. But I'd say, again, we just had that. We got to eat. Can you fix me a hamburger or spaghetti instead? That's the way we are. I don't want the nourishment that, that God provides me. I don't want what's best for me. I want junk that's going to stick with me for two minutes and taste good in the moment and then give me no nourishment whatsoever. God says, I've given you all the nourishment you need right here. You're not eating it now. So why would I give you more nourishment when you're not giving you what, eating what I've given you already? You've got to have fellowship. You've got to... 
You ought to be having an attitude of praise. It says they thank God every single time. Listen, you don't have to sit at every meal and, and say a 10-minute prayer, but you ought to say, you know, thank you, God, for this food. Thank you, Lord, that I know there are people that don't have this, and I just thank you that you have given me this. You ought to be singing praises in your car. There ought to be a, a song that comes on the radio and you just can't help but praise the Lord. That song in our car over and over and over. Ella will get in the car and she said, I am free, I am free. And I say, praise God, we live in the United States and we're free. And she's, oh, I am free. I am. You know, she wants a song on. We listen to it all the way back from Neo's show the other day, and I think at least three quarters of the way to Neo's show. I've never been so tired of a song in my life. Heather can, I mean, she listens to it, and she picks Elle up from daycare and drives her back. She, she was sitting there in these impromptu moments where the, like, like the guy says, you know, uh, the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And, and he's, it's just an impromptu moment. And, and she's singing right along with the impromptu moments now. I mean, it's, it's crazy how many times we've... But that's Ella's joy. She loves... You ought to have that in your life. That ought to be your song. And listen, it, it can't be guns and roses, okay? That's not spiritual. It, it, it can't be... It, it can't be... You know, I, I'm trying to, I started to say Clint Boyer, he's a NASCAR driver. Uh, George Strait, Garth Brooks, it can't be somebody like that. Clint Black, that's who I was thinking of. I don't even know, I can't even name a song Clint Black sings, but I don't know why he came to my mind. Maybe that's one of your favorites, and that was the Holy Spirit speaking right to you. You ought to have that time where you sing praise. It doesn't matter if it's in your car. It doesn't matter if you get up and it's in the shower. But there ought to be a time of praise in your life. You ought to be praying daily. It doesn't matter if it's in the morning. It doesn't matter if it's in the evening. As long as you're not falling asleep in bed, that matters. Because if you're putting yourself to sleep by prayer, that's not an effective prayer life. Could be in the car. I, some of my closest times with God are driving in the car from one place to another. But your heart has to beat in time with those four things. It's got to be a rate that is sustainable. The rate of revival is every single day. You say, that's impossible. I don't have time for that. Have you seen how busy it is? Listen, I get how they did this. They didn't have Little League Baseball to take the kids to. They didn't have football practice. They didn't have all of these things. That, they didn't have Netflix running the end of its episode two seconds now after that one's done and I just can't hit the back button once that's already started. They didn't have any of those things to deal with. I've got too much going on. They didn't have those things, but they had a lot going on in their lives. These were not just primitive people who did nothing all day and and, and just lounged around. and No, they worked. They had kids. They had a house to clean. More so than yours, probably, because they had dusty streets, and that gets in through the windows, doesn't it? They had to clean a lot more than we do. How do we do it? It's the same way that they did it. And it's in the very first verse that we're looking at, Acts 2.42. It says, and they devoted themselves to those four things. They devoted themselves. That, that means they committed to doing them. That means they surrendered to sacrifice, to pledge. That's what devoted means. It means you make it a top priority in your life. You have to commit yourself to time with God every single day. You have to surrender things in your life that you'd rather do or that just have to be done that day. We are so obsessed with being entertained in this society today and sometimes we have to sacrifice our entertainment for what really matters, which is a little time with God. 
Listen, I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just saying this because this is what the Lord put on my heart. I'm reading through the Bible four times this year. Halfway through my third time. You know how long that takes every day? And with my personality, I try to do it first thing when I wake up. I still lay in bed, and, and this time I'm reading it through. What I've done in the past is I've opened up my paper Bible, I've followed along, and I've underlined, and I've, I've got through a new Bible to underline and to pass on to my kids because I've got a new kid, right, Ella, who needs one of those. And, and so this time, this is the third time, I listened to it with, with the English Standard Version twice, I'm reading through this time with the New Living Translation because I want to change it up just a little bit. I don't have a New Living Translation, so I read it on my phone and I follow along. I don't just put it on in the car where I'm going to tune things out, but I follow along with it on my phone. And, and a lot of times I'm laying there in bed when I first get up and I'm following along with it in my phone. That takes some time. And here's what comes into my mind when I'm laying there until 9 o'clock or 9.30 because I've just spent 30 minutes reading my Bible and I think, man, it's 9.30 already. I could have done this. I, I, I've got to get up. I've got to do these things. I've got to do these things. Now here in a month, I won't be able to sleep in till 8.30 anymore because my kids got to be at school at 8 o'clock. But that's what happens. We think, I could have been doing this. I could have been doing... And, and in our mind, we're prioritizing those things over what's really important. What I needed to be doing was spending time in the Word. Those other things can wait. I've got from nine to five to do those things. But right now, this is what's important. This is the priority you have to pledge a block of time. You have to devote yourself to doing it, and you have to make yourself do it. That's what professional athletes do, isn't it? They devote themselves to working out every single day. Their season ends, if it's a professional football player, in either December or January, or if they make it to the Super Bowl, maybe early February. Maybe they take a week off, but then they're right back in the gym and they're right back on the field, and they're, and they're practicing, and they're, they're warming up, and they're throwing balls over and over and over. And if they take that week off, that's okay. But if they don't get back into it at the end of that week, the next year, you see their skill level decrease just a little bit. You see guys that think, I've made it, here I am, and they're great one year. Man, they win me a fantasy football championship. And then the next year I keep them because I think they were so great, but it went to their head that they were so good and they quit working out. And the next year, they're not worth a dime on there. That's the way we are. We miss a day. And we say, well, I missed yesterday, so one more day is not going to matter. One more day. No, you have to devote yourself to it. If you miss a day, pick it up. You know what I love about this Bible app? And this, this is so, i got to flip to it. This, this just really feeds into my OCD. When you open it up, it says, good morning, Jeremy. Oh, I love just when it speaks to me like that. I wish it spoke verbally in an Australian accent because that would be cooler than an English. It says streak 106. That means 106 straight days I have read my Bible. That means 107 days ago, for whatever reason, I did not read my Bible. Or sometimes what happens is I read it at 12.01 or something, and it doesn't count as a streak because it's midnight. Weeks, 27. 27 straight weeks. You know what that shows? That when I fell down 107 days ago, I got right back up. And that's what I love. That motivates me. Isn't that stupid? But it does. And that's what it takes. 
Motivate yourself. Devote yourself. Whatever it takes, no matter how dumb it is, do it. When the human heart is beating like it's supposed to, what happens? Awesome things. Blood begins to flow through your veins. It creates these cells that go in and fight off illnesses and, and things like that. Your heart is the start of when it's beating properly, all these awesome things happen in your body. And when you're beating in time with God, when you have the rhythm and the rate that you're supposed to, all these awesome things happen in revival too. Acts 2.43 says, Awe came upon every soul. Wouldn't it be awesome? To live in awe rather than in fear or despair or worry, but we're just awed all the time by what God is doing in our lives and in the lives of our family and our friends and everybody around us. Wouldn't it be nice to be, to be totally honest when we sing that song that we used to sing, I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. I've seen people Sing, I can't sing that song without lifting my hands and looking up to the head. I've seen people go, I stand, I stand in all of you. My heart breaks for them. There's no awe in your life? Come on. If there's awe in your life, you ought to be praising God for it every single day because I see these people struggling with what's going to happen. We stand in awe, it says, and then many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Where are the signs? Where are the wonders? Where is the heartbeat of revival? It's fast and it's regular. It's difficult to find a heartbeat sometimes. You say, well, where are these signs? Where are the it's difficult to find that. But there are ways to shock your life back in and to make it normal. Again, CPR, things like that. Verse 44, all who believed were together, had all things in common. They were sell that doesn't mean favorite sports team. That means all their items. You, you need this? Here. You need this? Here. Oh, you, you don't have uh, uh, some clippers to clip your hedge? Here you go, I've got those. You, you, you can use this. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Well, now they're not just looking at their own lives and somebody's coming in with a need and saying, ooh, stinks to be you. You know, helping hands is down the road. No, now they've fellowshiped with them, they've prayed with them, they've learned the Word of God together, they've sat in church together, they've done all these things. They're saying, I can't let you go hungry, let me take you down, let me buy you some groceries. And they're doing all these things because now they're not focused on themselves, now they're focused on God and His kingdom and those around Him. Verse 46 says, Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Who added to their number? The Lord. Here's where pastors and here's where churches get into a problem. How can we bring revival? What, can, what will bring people in the door? There's nothing wrong with programs. Don't get me wrong. You've got to have some structure in the church. You've got to have some outreach. You've got to have those things. But we focus on all that stuff, and we don't focus right here on ourselves. Revival starts where? With me. In us. When we focus on ourselves... And God, rather than everything else that's wrong with, with our perceptions, the Lord begins to add to that number. It was the heart of revival. It was beating at a normy, normal, healthy rate, and it was beating with a normal, healthy rhythm. That's what added to the church day by day. John Connie, would you come? Got to have a rhythm. 
You've got to have a rate. Those are the two things so far. Oh, there are three more. One of them we won't get to till after Lynn Wheeler's here. There are three more things you've got to have for revival. But today, here's what I want you to say. Holy Spirit, hook up that EKG. It's what they do, isn't it? If your heart's out of rhythm, if your heart's not beating at the right rate, some of you can, can, can tell everybody in here. They take you in. They hook you up to this machine. And you can sit there and watch it. And don't we like to pretend like we know what's going on? Well, that was a good one right there. I know nothing about any of those numbers and any of those peaks and valleys. But I'll stand there and watch that thing when I'm with somebody in the hospital for an hour. We're interested in that. But when it's hooked up to our heart, I don't know that I want to know the answer to that. Holy Spirit, hook the EKG up to us today. What's our rhythm? What's our rate? Are they where they need to be? Are they not? Do I need a code blue called in my life? Which chamber's not working? Got somebody related to me by marriage, I saw on Facebook, has, has a bad heart. He's finding this out like, I mean, he's probably 40 years old. Something they fix a lot of time in childhood. And, and he's now finding, he presumably had this problem his, his whole life. We pray that they can go in and they can fix whatever's broken in there. Whatever's not working properly. What chamber of your heart? Is it prayer? Is it worship? Is it the word? What is it?